And welcome back to our next edition of the CBB Review Studio Podcast. I am Dan Siegel, joined by my co-host Ben Anderson, and we are here to rank the 18 coaches that have been hired at high major schools this offseason cycle. So when we say high major, we have 18. This is because we are including the Big Five conferences, so the Big East, Big Ten, ACC, SEC, Big 12, as well as the AAC and the Mountain West. So we're including those seven conferences. These are consensus rankings that Ben and I agreed upon before the show. And we are recording on April 15th. There's still openings throughout the country, such as the one at BYU. So this is not every single hire, but most of them have been done. And finally, before we start, I just want to reiterate that we are ranking the hires of these 18 coaches. We are not ranking the power. We are not power ranking each of the 18 coaches on purely how good they are, but the hires. So not every program is on equal playing field, et cetera. We'll talk about that, but let's get to number 18, the worst hire of these 18. And we are going to say that is Vance Wahlberg, who was hired at Fresno state coming out of Clovis West high school. Ben, why is this? number 18 on our list. Well, it's not so much Wahlberg as it is the other coaches, I think, that we have coming up on the list. I think they're actually a pretty strong group of of coaches that were hired, but it's always difficult to go from a high school to a college coaching position, especially to a D1 level and especially to the Mountain West, which has been proven to be a competitive league. In addition, Wahlberg didn't have a fantastic stint Um, when he was past head coach at Pepperdine in the mid-2000s. So ultimately, there was just nowhere else to put him, unfortunately. Yeah, resume, not impressive. The high school, Clovis West, is a local school. They're very good, but I don't think they're, like, nationally, like, super well-known. And he also kind of flamed out in the NBA when he was an assistant there. So not the greatest hire there. Number 17 on our list, we have Austin Clonch coming from an Alabama assistant to UTSA. Now, UTSA does have a rough history, but still nothing too appealing about this hire. Um, He was doing okay at Nichols, but then left to join as Nate Oates' assistant. And he might be able to elevate UTSA a little bit, but now they're in the AAC. And I'm just, I'm not really thinking that he could really raise, be the guy to raise them to relevant status. Yeah, I think this. It was interesting. He was only at Alabama for one year before going back, and I guess he just really wanted to have his own program, right, rather than be under a head coach, even if it's at a power conference school. He didn't have – it didn't blow you away at Nichols, and like you said, UTSA is a tough job in a tougher league than they once were. So um, I think this is more of a a job thing than it is Austin Klon specifically. I think anyone would be sort of ranked down here if they went to San Antonio. Fair enough. And then number 16, we got Jared Calhoun coming over to Utah State from Youngstown State. What do you think of this hire? Yeah, so he never made the tournament when he was at Youngstown State, but that is one of the most difficult jobs, arguably, in the country, right? It's just in a Midwestern town. It's You see it sometimes, especially with football, um, like Toledo and, Ak- Toledo and Kent State and Akron are, no- are notably tough jobs, sort of Youngstown State and basketball. Um, I think it's a good ish higher it's just hard to predict how it will transfer up and especially if you don't have that tournament resume you don't really you haven't seen proof of concept yet and i think that's what's concerned both of us a little bit yeah utah state's an interesting program it's kind of been like a a leaping platform for coaches Mm -hmm. to get to that that power conference level and they've had three coaches in the last four cycles move to a better program craig smith ryan odom and most recently danny sprinkle who will be set at some point on this podcast but I talk about those three coaches who have been able to come right in and make keep Utah State good. I think Calhoun is a, is a significant downgrade from those three coaches. So that's why I voted to keep them so low. But moving on to number 15, we got Mark Pope coming over from BYU to Kentucky. Now, I will preface – we I know everybody has thoughts on this one. I'm going to preface this segment by saying – I don't think Pope is a bad coach. I do think it is an extremely underwhelming hire. I feel like the program could have done a lot better. Maybe they could have gone after 
Billy Donovan because they would have been able to kind of just wait a week. I could totally understand if Billy Donovan was not interested in going back to college basketball to coach, especially at a program with the pressure of Kentucky. That said, there was no reports that indicated Billy Donovan outright said, I'm not interested in the job. It looked, it seems like Kentucky just didn't really search for him. Now, the last thing I'll say is if you think John Calipari was the issue, Mark Pope has never won an NCAA tournament game in his career. So what do you have to say about all that? Yeah, I think you were a little bit lower. We aggregated these these rankings because I think Dan was a little bit lower than I was on the Pope hire. And to be fair, the press conference did produce some positive momentum. But on the whole, I think it's more of, like you said, a job deal rather than is Mark Pope a good coach. Now, he didn't have as much success at Utah Valley as Mark Madsen did, right? He didn't win a tournament game at BYU, even though he probably should have, especially when they were playing Duquesne this year. Um, and I'm just a little bit concerned about what his recruiting will look like, as you see in the entire, basically the entire 2024 recruiting class for Kentucky has been released from their NLIs. Um, it could work, and Kentucky mostly sets you up to succeed. It'll have all the resources in the world. It'll just be up to him to make sure you know, he takes advantage of those resources, and I'll be interested to see if his run-and-gun style works out there offensively. So. Uh, I'm not saying this ki- this isn't going to work, but I have more doubts than I thought I would about Kentucky's new head coach. All right, and then going a little bit lower profile for number 14, we got John – is it Jockis from uh, the Baylor assistant role to Florida Atlantic University. This one is kind of a wild card to me, both from the coaching perspective and the job perspective because – He was an assistant under two of the most successful regimes in the nation, being uh, Scott Drew and Mark Few, Gonzaga and Baylor. But he also has zero head coaching experience. You know, the the typical route is being a successful mid-major going up to a a better head coaching job. But also FAU is a weird program to evaluate because Dusty May, who again we'll talk about later, he elevated their status over the last, you know, three some odd years. But historically, they're irrelevant. So I've had trouble really making a decision on this, but I think it's fine to have him here. Yeah, I think I was just a little bit lower. I wonder if um, a lot of his perceived success or potential success comes from a type like Jerome Tang, where you saw the success he had at Kansas State, and maybe he's able to – Jockas is able to – replicate that at FAU, but Kansas State and FAU are not are not on the same level. So I'll be interested to see whether Florida Atlantic continues to invest in the program like they did under Dusty May. And if he does, uh, John may have success there, but if not, it's just hard to predict. Number 13, we had Jake Diebler, who was promoted from the Ohio State assistant eventually to interim head coach and eventually to full-time head coach. What do you think of this? Uh it hasn't there hasn't been the best track record of promoting interim to full-time head coaches in the past um right the most notable example for me is Ozzie Brown when he got promoted after Greg Marshall was uh let go from Wichita State he was fired within two years I believe they have been doing good work in the portal so far I will give them that they picked up Aaron Broadchild today they picked up Michi Johnson on the transfer back um but it's just hard to grade on a coach that's only had seven games of experience and he did he did some good things in that those seven games but um i don't know i i'm generally not a fan of hiring like internal promotions when you thought you had to fire the guy that they worked for no no that that's totally true like why are you keeping around part of a regime that failed to a certain extent and if you if you if you include postseason record he did end last year eight and three but yeah that that's exactly like also Diebler's never been fully in charge of a program. So it's hard to evaluate him from that standpoint. So totally agree on all those points. Number 12, we have Steve Lutz going from Western Kentucky to Oklahoma state. Ben was, a, you were a lot higher on him than I was. So yeah, I think this is, yeah, I think this is the one where we differed the most actually. So Steve Lutz has never lost or has never not made the tournament as a head coach. And that sort of speaks to me in terms of what can Oklahoma, like what more could you want from Oklahoma State in terms of hiring 
a candidate. He did. He took Texas A&M Corpus Christi to two straight tournaments in his first two years, moved over to Western Kentucky, and then did the same thing. At some point, for me, it's sort of not a fluke. And I just think he's a good basketball coach. And if you're Oklahoma State, you're not at, like, you're not a Kentucky, you're not a Louisville, you're not even, like, a Alabama or, you know, a, a second – or you may be a second-tier job, but it's not like you're going out and being able to poach someone. I, I just think this is a really solid hire, and I think – he provides a high floor for the Cowboys. Mm, I just, I think for a big 12 school, especially they could have gotten somebody with just a more sustained resume, right? He's only been a head coach for three years. I get that he made the tournament each of those times, but each of those times it was winning their conference and the conference tournament. So it could have been a fluke, right? Like yeah. it's not like he had tremendous, like 28 win regular seasons. But he's, but he's he's go ahead go ahead. Well, I don't even necessarily view it as a high floor. I'm I view it as kind of a little bit of a risk. But I was gonna say he also has that high major experience, not as a head coach, but he's been an assistant under Greg McDermott. He's been an assistant under Matt Painter, and I think those are two very good programs to work for and to come out of in terms of head coaching success. You've seen it with Shrewsbury, um, and I know we just like I I made the false equivalency like two coaches ago, but like, I don't know. He's proven, they have proven to me that they can succeed as a head coach. And I think that gives me a little bit more confidence than maybe a, a John Jacobs. Okay. So we'll, we'll agree to disagree here. Yeah. Let's keep it rolling. Number 11, we have Andy Enfield who SMU now. Uh, interesting here. Normally I would say grabbing someone who was able to sustain themselves in a power conference for 10 years. That's really good. But remember, SMU is going to the ACC now. Expectations, the standards have been raised as a result. I still think it's a pretty solid hire because Enfield had plenty of success prior to that downfall where he, I mean, he had one really bad year this past year and there's politics involved and all that. But then you also have the SM, the weird firing of Rob Lanier and whether Enfield is an upgrade. There's a lot going on there. Yeah, for me, it's just sort of he has had some success, but he's also done it with five stars. And he's underachieved just as often as he's achieved with those five stars, in my opinion. Right. He's had some down years here and there. Um, he did have that elite eight run, which they looked really good. Um, but also it did kind of feel like he was on his way out. Right. Of, of USC and he sort of took the, you know, shock of smart taking the Marquette job route of going to going to a different job before you get fired. I don't know how to feel about this because US SMU is not USC in the sense that you, they have a lot of money, but I'm not sure you can pull players to Dallas in the same way that you can pull players to LA. Um, and I do feel like he's relied a lot on talent in his career to like player talent. Um, I don't know. I think it could work. I think it could work, but, the ACC is a step up for SMU too. Yeah, absolutely. All right, number 10, Pat Kelsey, Louisville's newest head coach. What are your thoughts on him? So in a vacuum, I like any power conference team to hire Pat Kelsey. I think he's a good coach. He also doesn't have a tournament win, and he's getting hired at Louisville, which is at worst a top 10 job in the country. So this is sort of similar to Pope in the sense that you don't have that bona fide resume I don't think quite yet however I just think Kelsey's a better coach than Pope and that's sort of why I think he's a little bit higher on our list would you agree with that Dan I also think Kentucky's a better job than Louisville but that's fair yeah yeah that's a good point Kelsey has I mean he's been successful at the mid-major level for longer than I feel like is the minimum criteria to get a promotion and like compared to some of his peers he's really overly qualified um I think Louisville just having someone that's competent, just the the contrast between Kenny Payne and Pat Kelsey probably adds them up a couple of rankings just because you have somebody that actually knows how to coach basketball and run a team. So that's good for them. But yeah, I think 10's a, 10's a fair spot for them. Number nine, we got Chris Holtman from Ohio State to DePaul. Um, Holtman is an okay coach, right? He's not great. He's not awful, but then you have to consider Ohio State and DePaul. Just they're not equals. DePaul might be the worst program in the power or power five now, and I think this is the best case scenario for them. Yeah, I, so the way I think about this is 
if you weren't successful at Ohio State, who has all the resources in the world, I don't feel super confident that you'd be able to be successful at DePaul. But I guess the question is, what is success for DePaul? Is it not looking like they were this year? Or is it like, actually, you want to make the tournament? Because I think those are two different. Like, what I, is, is Holtman considered a success if he goes 17 and 15 for four straight years? I don't know. Right? I don't know the, the, the Paul job that well, but I think that would really help me form a better opinion on whether Holman is a good hire here. Because I don't think he can take him. I don't think he's DePaul's savior. Just, I, just yeah, no, but just given what DePaul is right now, maybe yeah. he, could, he could get them to a place where they could be in a better position four or five years down the line. You know what I'm saying? Everyone, Everyone's a step up, though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. who are they going to get that's better? Number eight. We alluded to him earlier, Rob Lanier coming over to Rice. This is a phenomenal hire to, for Rice. I believe we both agree on this because Rice is a tough program to win at, and they got a very capable coach. I don't think he deserves to be fired at SMU. They were actually improving. That was just a very weird firing, and Rice is the beneficiary of the fact that a very good coach, very solid coach, fell into their lap. Yeah, absolutely. Like in a vacuum, I don't think Rob Lanier is a better coach necessarily than Pat Kelsey or a couple of other people we've mentioned on the like at, at lower ranks. But this is Rice we're talking about. I think a lot of schools would be happy. The majority of D1 schools would be happy with this hire. And for Rice to be able to get a coach that just won over 20 games at SMU um, and was fired uh, just because they the Mustangs wanted someone to, to come in to the ACC with like a, a splashy a splashy pick, I think this is a really good position for the Owls to be in. Number seven, Kyle Smith, staying out west from Washington State. Washington State, by the way, now in the West Coast Conference, so not on the show. Going over to Stanford, now in the ACC. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you can win at Washington State, right, we've talked about this before, Kelvin Sams and Tony Bennett, now Kyle Smith. If you can win a tournament game at Washington State, chances are you're a pretty good coach. And I think Kyle Smith is a good – fit for Stanford. You know, Jared Haas, for, say what you want about him not making the tournament, but he, he brought in talent. I think almost Cal Smith could be the opposite where you don't have the splashy names, the five stars that come in to Palo Alto, but you could look up and Stanford is consistently finishing top six, top seven in the ACC. Yeah, no, totally. Like everything you just said, it, like it's, it, he, Kyle Smith proved he could win at a very similar type of school where it's not so easy to win beneficiary of conference realignment is Stanford over Washington state. That's why they get the coach. All right. Now we have to talk here. Number six, John Calipari coming from Kentucky to Arkansas. I understand the struggles at Kentucky, but there's evidence to prove that John Calipari recruits, not Kentucky recruits, but John Calipari like in a pre, like he he recruited five stars five star town at Memphis as well. So Cal Perry is going to bring that recruiting success over to Arkansas. Now with that recruiting success will come with a lot of the problems he had at Kentucky, right? His flaws as an X's and O's coach. That'll still be there, but the expectations are not Kentucky level anymore. I think this is a great fit. Or maybe not fit, but just a great hire for if you're from an Arkansas perspective. Yeah, it's a good hire. I mean, they couldn't have gone. They got John freaking Cal Perry. He's one of the few yeah. coaches that have won a NCAA championship, right? By by all means, that's a good a good hire. My thing here, though, is that a lot was made of Arkansas now all having this huge NIL budget, and this was a thing that brought him to Fayetteville and and you know all that. The question was never whether John Cal Perry could recruit, right? He's always he NIL money or not five stars are going to come play for him. The question is whether he can solve like a, a zone that Oakland throws at him in the tournament. <laughs> Will that change? Right. And if so, is their pressure going to be, because Arkansas is still a good job. And that's what I'm interested. That's where my slight hesitation is with this whole thing is like, what, what makes you think he's going to be better than Eric Musselman who went to, you know, was it three elite eights in three straight years? Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, elite eight, elite eight, sweet 16, I believe. Or yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, do you think do you have confidence that Kyle Perry is going to do that in his first four years? No, but do you have confidence that Musselman would be able to do that again? That's fair. I think I don't know. What who do you think? Who do you think would have a better four years? Mm, probably Musselman. Yeah. Probably Muscle because he but also I don't know. Like 
actually we'll we a disaster of a year to that, this year too. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna talk about Musselman. Like you know it, he's in our top five because we haven't mentioned it yet. So we'll we'll get to that. But moving into our number five spot, we have Mark Byington going over from James Madison to Vanderbilt. This is one of the hottest mid major coaches on the market. That's why he's number five on our list. Vanderbilt is not the school you'd necessarily expect to get what I would presume was their first choice, but they got their first choice. Byington in his fourth season at James Madison won 32 games, really built that program up. I mean, I know like the administration really, really supported him with financial resource investments, but he also won games. So great hire for Vandy. Yeah, I agree. I mean, this is just really solid from from Vanderbilt here. I don't have much to add beyond what you said. He, if you win a tournament game at James Madison, you're doing really well for yourself. Um, Vanderbilt's always going to be a tough job, right? And it'll be interesting to see how he succeeds or what we define as success for, for them in Nashville. But they couldn't have done better, I don't think, in this hiring cycle. Danny Sprinkle is our number four person on our list. He jumps up for the second consecutive offseason, first from Montana State to Utah, Utah State, then most recently from Utah State to Washington. What do you think of Danny Sprinkle? Yeah, so the success cannot be denied on the court. He's had a great past three years. I'm, I do wonder. I do wonder what happens if he do, if he can't keep bringing the same team with great Alcibor and Darius Brown everywhere he goes, and he has to like rebuild it, right? It did feel like a lot of the success was based off of him you're playing basically his Montana State team, and they happen to have a ton of good players, especially for a low major. It'll be int- I, I, I do wonder what it'll look like in like year three in Washington, should he choose to stay that long. Uh, I just he's won everywhere, right? I agree. No, no, no. It's a great hire. I just that's yeah. I think I, th- I that's why we don't have him number one. Okay, okay. Well, number three, we got Dusty May going over from Florida and Atlantic to Michigan. May was rumored to be a high major hire. After his final four run, instead got a pay raise as FAU moved from Conference USA to the American Athletic Conference. And then he took Florida Atlantic to another tournament season, which arguably was even more impressive. It wasn't just like winning four games and, you know, a, a, a madness spot, but having another sustained regular season in, in a better league, 14 and four. He's a program builder and a winner. And I think. Michigan is just a much larger scale of what he did at FAU. So I think he'll be successful here. Absolutely. Yeah, I think this is the best coach Michigan could have gotten in this cycle. If you're going to fire Jawan Howard, you got to make sure you hit right on your next coach. And, and being able to get Dusty May over the likes of Louisville or a couple of other jobs that maybe want Ohio State, right? Those are always going to be wins for the Wolverines. And I think May will be successful there. Um if you if you go to a Final Four at Florida Atlantic, I mean, you've seen the gym, right? It looks like a yeah, high school cool. gym, stuff like that. It's a tough job. I think he'll do well at, 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 in Ann Arbor. All right. We talked about him already. Number two, Eric Musselman. He goes to USC from Arkansas. Now, we're going to talk about this mostly from a USC perspective, and I believe that's a home run hire. You can make a reasonable argument that he – probably a very valid argument that he went to a worse program – it's kind of interesting philosophy, like, oh, like, you know, the struggles are just starting. So before anything really gets bad, let me just jump ship to a place where I'll be embraced. It's an, it's an, it's an interesting philosophy for Musselman. But, um, yeah, another guy that's done nothing but win everywhere he's gone. What do, you, what do you have to add here? Yeah, from my understanding, he's from Southern California as well. So I think it's a little bit of a homecoming for him, too. Maybe if this was another job that wasn't located in Los Angeles, he wouldn't be jumping Ar- jumping ship from Arkansas to come here. But I think USC is a good enough job to where it makes sense for him. Um, he's going to win at USC. I really don't have, have much doubt there. Yeah, I, I just think this is the best USC could have done. It makes sense for muscle men. I, I would be very happy if I was in. Southern California right now. And then number one on our list, Darian DeVries from Drake to West Virginia. Now, first off, in a similar sense to Pat Kelsey, this guy, DeVries, was overdue, in my opinion, for a promotion. He was at Drake for six years. You know what his record was in those six years? 150 and 55, just an incredible record. West Virginia was kind of in a progr- uh, position of instability with the whole Bob Huggins situation. But we also don't know what life without Bob Huggins looks like at West Virginia. 
well, this is the perfect guy to, to, to hand your program to now in a new era of Mountaineers basketball. And they also get his son, Tucker. So that's a big bonus. That's a big starting point for, for, a, for a program. They do have also a couple of other recruits that were in the Drake program that they're looking for. Kevin Overton, I know, was like a very talented freshman that people were looking at even before DeVries took the West Virginia job to maybe enter the transfer portal. I, You couldn't do better, I think, if you were West Virginia. This is a home run hire. Doesn't mean it'll always work out because we can't predict the future. But I'm from a process standpoint, I, I'm, I would be very pleased if I were in Morgantown. And, and this is what I heard was happening with our new head men's basketball coach. This is a good hire, and I don't have a problem with it being number one overall. All right, and that will do it for today's edition of the CBB Review Studio podcast. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube. Leave us a like on this video. We will be pumping out content throughout the offseason. So stay tuned there. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening, and take care.